good morning, everyone. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Pastor Ivan Yu. So, Pastor Ivan Yu is a youth pastor in the Chinese Gospel Church of Massachusetts. Um, he has previously served as English pastor in the Chinese Christian Church of Greater Albany. And he has a master degrees of divinity from the Northeast Branch of Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary in Schenectady, New York. And he has studied, he is currently studying for a PhD in theology and apologetics at Liberty University. Uh, Pastor Ivan is very passionate about preaching God's word. Uh, he's happily married with his wife Joyce. And they have two kids, Olive, a daughter of Dean Olive, and a son named Damien. Uh, Pastor Ivan enjoys reading, writing, play piano, uh, and video and, au and audio editing, as well as watching anime. There's a lot of things in common that I have with Pastor Yu that I enjoy doing. Um, Pastor Yu uh, preached to us with, from the book of uh, uh, Gospel of John and tell us about having eternal satisfactions in Christ. Without further ado, let me uh, pass the... Uh, uh, allow Pastor you to share. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Henry, for uh, that introduction. Uh, as you know, I'm uh, Pastor Ivan Yu, and I'm very glad to have the chance this morning to be able to share from uh, God's Word with uh, everyone. And uh, actually, when I first heard that uh, your church in Springfield was uh, starting an English worship service, I was very excited about it and uh, very happy to see how God may be working in your church and helping your church to be able to grow. So I continue to pray for your church. I pray that your church will have more opportunities to be able to reach out to the youth, to um, American-born Chinese and other English speakers, in addition to uh, Chinese immigrants uh, for the gospel. So as many of you may know, uh, today is a very important day. Uh, yes, it is Sunday. We're here to worship God. But it also happens to be Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, so I know that we may be disappointed that the Patriots aren't in the Super Bowl uh, this year. But... Uh, I don't know whether uh, you're going to be rooting for the Buccaneers or rooting for the Chiefs, but at least we know that Tom Brady's in the Super Bowl because uh, he's with the Buccaneers now. Uh, for those of us who don't really care too much about uh, the Super Bowl, uh, some of us may still watch the Super Bowl because it's an important event in our uh, American culture. And often people watch it just for the commercials because all the commercials are very entertaining. They're very uh, memorable and uh, when we, uh, when we watch like these uh, commercials, I want us to notice that usually commercials, they give us a sense like, of a promise. You know? They usually tell us, oh, if you buy our product, you will be satisfied. If you get our product, you will be happy. You, you will have your desires fulfilled. So it gives us this promise to us. But very often, that promise can be able to fail us. You know, think about a lot of slogans for a lot of uh, products, like a Nike. It's just like, just do it. Or McDonald's, uh, have it your way. Uh, or no, that's Burger King. Uh, McDonald's is, uh, I'm loving it. Uh, or Lay's, you know, the, the chips company, you know, bet you can't just eat one. If you look at all these slogans, you know, these companies, they know that human beings often have these unmet desires. And they seek to promote the product in a way to say that if you buy a product, we can be able to satisfy that desire that you have inside of you. I think it's true. Uh, that companies know, and each and every one of us know that deep down inside, maybe a lot of us are trying to seek for something in this life that will be able to satisfy us. You may try to find this satisfaction in having good grades. Maybe you try to find the satisfaction in getting that job promotion or wanting to have the, the newest technologies, wanting to be popular, or wanting to have that relationship that you, ever, like, you always wanted. So we go through this life trying to seek for something that will satisfy us. And then maybe once we get that, what we are desiring, we then realize that it doesn't actually satisfy us. Like that, that goes away and we desire something else. So we're back on the search to try to seek for something that will be able to satisfy us, that will be able to last. And it can be very painful to live like life like that. So I'm here to tell you that true eternal satisfaction can only come through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, He said, I am the bread of life. So today, as we look into our passage, we'll see how, as Jesus says, I am the bread of life, we can be able to know that He is the only one who can be able to provide us with this true eternal satisfaction. 
So if you have your Bibles, I invite you all to take them out. And please uh, turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 6. John chapter 6, we're going to be reading from verses 22 all the way to 35. So I hope you're here with me, John chapter 6, verses 22 to 35. Please follow along as I read. This is the word of the Lord. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there. And Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what signs do you do that we may see and believe you? What works do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall, shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you all to bow your heads with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we have this uh, Sunday morning to be able to come together to worship you, even though we're online, even though we're on Zoom. But Lord, we are, your word can still be heard. We pray that you would teach us as we look into your word today. Open our eyes, open our hearts, so that we can see the wonderful things in your word. Father, maybe there are some of us who may be trying to seek for satisfaction in this life. We know that there is something missing in our life. I pray that you will show us that you are the bread of life and that you can be able to truly satisfy us. Lord, please teach us, Lord. We lift up these things in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. So for today, uh, as we go through this passage, we're going to be answering one main question. So if you're someone who likes to take notes, I encourage you to to write this question down. So the question that we're going to be answering is this. When are the times we do not experience true eternal satisfaction? All right. So again, the question that we're going to be asking is, when are the times do we not experience true eternal satisfaction? And from this passage, I believe that there's going to be three moments. Three moments that can be able to show that uh, we do not experience true eternal satisfaction. So let's begin with uh, the the first uh, moment as we return back to this uh, passage. So uh, just as a background, like from from this passage, uh, Jesus and his uh, disciples before, they were on the other side of the Sea of Galilee near the town of uh, Bethsaida. And there were crowds of people that gathered to him, uh, listening to him preach and uh, uh, heal people. And then when they were hungry, Jesus had performed a miracle. You know, he, he fed 5,000 people with just a boy's lunch of uh, you know, five loaves of bread and two fish. And then the next part in the chapter, uh, the, he and his, or his disciples have gone to the boat and they went across the Sea of Galilee to the other side. But Jesus didn't get on the boat uh, because later on, you, as you know in the story, he walked across the water and he met up with his disciples uh, on the boat. So now here on the next day, where we uh, begin reading in this passage in uh, John chapter 6, uh, the crowds of people uh, who were looking, f- uh, they were trying to look for Jesus uh, because they want more bread. They want more food. They want to see him. And they eventually found him in the Sea of Capernaum. So let's read uh, from verse uh, 22 again in uh, John chapter 6. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat of his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. 
Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. So here we have the same crowd of people who were fed uh, by Jesus, uh, the, the same 5,000 people. They went to look for Jesus, found him on the other side of the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. So you have to th uh, think about this. You know, they, they, they knew that uh, Jesus uh, wasn't in, uh, didn't get onto the boat with his uh, disciples. So when they found him, they, they asked, how did he get here? Verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And actually, they probably asked, how did you get here? We didn't see you get on the boat with the disciples. So they probably didn't know that Jesus could walk across the, the water. And how did Jesus respond? He says this in verse 26. Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Truly, truly, I say to you. Your translation may say, I tell you the truth. Or verily, verily, I say to you. So whenever Jesus says something like this, it shows that what he's saying next is very important. And what did Jesus reveal? Jesus revealed that what was truly like on the people's hearts for the reason why they were seeking for him. They were seeking for him not because they were looking for signs, but rather because merely they wanted more food. So what is a sign? A sign is merely something that's supposed to point to a destination. So like if you're driving, you see a stop sign, it's supposed to point to the fact that you're supposed to stop. Or you see a, a sign saying, okay, this is exit 23. It means that you're supposed to get off of this exit. So when you see a sign, it's supposed to point us into a, a, a certain direction. It's supposed to point to us to a destination. So when Jesus had fed the 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish, it was supposed to be a sign pointing the people to the fact that He is supposed to be God. That he is the true Son of God. Let's read uh, verse uh, 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. From on him, God the Father has set his seal. You see, the crowds of people, they were so focused on getting food that perishes and that doesn't satisfy them, that and instead, they didn't focus on the fact of the sign that Jesus is God. The, the, the fact that they can be able to have this food which, which really endures to eternal life. And this eternal life can only be provided through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So let's answer our question. When are the times we do not experience true eternal satisfaction? Here is the first point, the first moment. We do not experience true eternal satisfaction when we seek Jesus for the wrong reasons. I'll say it one more time. We do not experience true eternal satisfaction when we seek Jesus for the wrong reasons. So again, these people, when they were trying to find Jesus and they went across the sea to, and found Him in Capernaum, they were looking for Him because they wanted more bread, they wanted more food, and not because that He is the true Son of God who can provide them with eternal satisfaction eternal life. So I know that you think of uh, some, some things that, uh, you know, we, we don't, there's a certain purpose for that thing, but then we don't do like something else. So uh, for example, uh, if someone wants to go to McDonald's, you know, there's a main purpose of it. You know, you want to get meat, you can get hamburgers. But what if someone went to McDonald's just so that they can get a salad? You know, no one really does that. Uh, or let's say that uh, someone who goes to the movie theater, but then instead of watching the, the main movie, they just go there just to watch the, the previews. They watch the trailers. See, no one in their right mind would do that. You know, the main pur purpose of going to the movie theaters is so that you can watch the main film. Or just like uh, today, there's going to be a Super Bowl. Uh, what if there are people that just watch the Super Bowl mainly for the commercials or for the, the ads? You see, likewise, no, I think at times, we, there is a purpose for seeking God, for seeking Jesus. But we may seek Jesus for the wrong reasons. See, God is mainly in the business of transforming us, providing us with our spiritual needs. His main business isn't necessarily just merely providing us for our physical needs. He provides us with our spiritual needs, forgiveness of sins, for salvation, to help us to be more holy. 
So let's think of some examples of what are some things that we may seek Jesus for, we may ask Him for when we pray. Now we may ask for uh, good health, we may, may ask for good grades, we may ask uh, for uh, a, a, a job or a, a raise, we um, may ask for money to pay off a debt. And, and I'm here to say, like, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong for you to ask for these things. And actually, in fact, Jesus invites us to come to Him with whatever needs we may have, whether they're physical, whether they're spiritual. But we have to remember that when we pray and when we seek to Him, are we only asking for our physical needs? So I want to ask everyone, how do you seek Jesus? Do you only go to Jesus when you need help or when you need something or when you are in trouble? No, Jesus isn't just like a vending machine to get whatever you want. So it's like you uh, take a, a, a prayer coin, you insert it in the vending machine. Uh, God, I want uh, a girlfriend. Boom. And then out comes a girlfriend. Or God, I want uh, good grades. Hit that other button. And then out comes like good, good grades. So I mean, God, Jesus isn't like a, a vending machine. Uh, he wants to, in addition, provide us with our spiritual needs and as well as our desires for you in order for us to have this true eternal satisfaction in Him that will help us to grow in faith and trust. So again, like I said, there's nothing wrong to pray to God and ask for Him to provide for our physical needs. But when you do ask Jesus to provide for your physical needs and we see that Jesus does provide for you, you should praise God for that. Because you have to uh, remember that just as He provides us for our temporary physical needs, even greater, He can be able to provide us for our spiritual needs, this greater need, our sense of salvation and forgiveness of sins. And actually, in fact, by providing for our physical needs, Jesus may use that as an opportunity to provide for our spiritual needs as well. Because once He provides for, us for our physical needs, we can be able to see, have our faith and trust in Him grow. So that is actually a fulfillment of our spiritual needs as well. So my encouragement for you all is that as you seek Jesus, seek for Him for the right reasons. Yes, ask for Him to provide for your physical needs, but as a form of, of trust in Him. And in addition, also ask for Him to provide for your spiritual needs. Do you, do you ask Him to help you grow to be more like Him? Do you ask Him to help you to repent of your sins and to be more holy? Do we ask Him to, to, to help us to, uh, to grow in our relationship with Him more and more every single day of our life. So how often do we ask God and do we seek Jesus for this reason, for this understanding of Him, for growth, for sanctification? So again, when are the times we may not experience eter true eternal satisfaction? Again, the first point, the first moment, we do not experience true eternal satisfaction when we seek Jesus for the wrong reasons. So as we continue on in this passage, I believe that there is a second moment when we may not experience this true eternal satisfaction. And actually, I'll give you the second point uh, right away. So here's the second moment. We do not experience true eternal satisfaction when we believe we need to work in order to earn it. So again, the second point, the second moment, we do not experience true eternal satisfaction when we believe we need to work in order to earn it. So let's get back to our passage here. Uh, let's read verse 27. Jesus told the crowds, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on Him God the Father has set His seal. So here, Jesus already told the crowds that He, the Son of Man, only can be able to provide them with, quote, this food that endures to eternal life. So he, he tells them how, he can, how they can get eternal life, how they can be satisfied, only through being provided by, for by through Him. But how do the crowds respond? Let's read verse 28. Then they said to Him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? So you notice like, the crowds, they ask Him, What must we do? But what did Jesus just say? Jesus said that you didn't need to do anything because He, as the Son of Man, can be, is, only, is the only one that can be able to provide them with this food that leads to eternal life. It's a gift. He gives it to them. They don't need to do anything, but yet these people, they still ask Jesus, what must we do in order to be able to earn this eternal life? How does Jesus respond? Let's read verse 29. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you may believe in Him whom he has sent. 
In uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 8 to 9, it says, like, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So, this, even this uh, verse in Ephesians tells us that salvation only comes by, uh, by, by faith through grace in Jesus Christ. So, it's not about our good works. If it is about our good works, then, then you know what it means? It means that we need to be perfect. You know, if we want to earn our way to go to heaven, to go to salvation, God desires for us to be holy, to be perfect. But you see, this is impossible. No one can be able to be 100% perfect and be able to earn their way into heaven. Even if you do nothing in this life except tell one little small lie, that little lie is enough to be able to separate us from God because God desires holiness and perfection. You know, imagine you have a pure cup of water, but you have this small drop of cyanide in there, would you still drink it? No, because even a small drop of cyanide can be able to pollute the whole thing and make it poisonous. You wouldn't uh, drink that. So this is why it's not up to our good works. It's impossible. But yet, in our human nature, we often feel that, oh, this is too easy. We, we often feel like we have to work, we have to earn something. And I see this prevalent in our Chinese culture at many times, because uh, I know uh, our parents and in our Chinese culture, you know, we, we hear voices that telling us to work very hard, make sure that you get good grades, make sure that you get into a good uh, co uh, college, make sure you get a good job, and, and work very hard. And those are very good uh, work ethics as, as well. But, be but sometimes this takes it to an extreme, where when we're giving a gift, especially when it's salvation that comes through faith in Jesus Christ, you know, we feel a little bit uncomfortable because we often feel like, oh, I still need to do something, I still need to work for it. You know, even in our uh, Chinese culture, uh, then you know how sometimes like, you have families uh, who would fight over the bill. And do you know why we do that? Because one family, like if the other family pays for the bill for the, the meal, then the other family, they don't want to get the sense that they want to be able to owe the other person. You know, they, we, we don't want to feel like we have to owe them because we want to make sure that we do something to pay them back. But you have to think about it in our relationship with God. It is impossible for us to be able to pay back Jesus for what He has done to, uh, in, in terms of giving us salvation. He died on the cross for our sins. He paid the price for everyone's sins in the world, past, present, and even in the future. So if it were possible for us to pay back Jesus, and if it's possible for us to earn our salvation through being perfect by doing good works, then we do not need Jesus at all. So maybe the reason why we don't feel satisfaction in this life is maybe because we're trying to do something that is impossible. Maybe we're trying to work for our salvation. Or maybe we're trying to uh, we, we do something to be able to pay back uh, Jesus or to try to be a, a, a good Christian. But then we, when we fail, we just feel very bad about it. We forget about the grace and the love and uh, that comes through salvation and uh, through Jesus uh, Christ. Maybe you aren't feeling that satisfaction because you have this mentality of working. Much like how the crowds here, when Jesus told them how they can have eternal sat satisfaction, how can they can have eternal life because He is going to give it to them, they still have this work-based mentality by asking Jesus, what must we do? Now a while ago, uh, I read about uh, this instant cake mix uh, that uh, was a big flop. It didn't really sell well uh, because the, the instructions merely said that all you have to do was add water to the mix and then put it in the oven and bake. And then out comes uh, this, uh, uh, this cake. And the company couldn't understand why it didn't sell so well until they did the research and then they discovered that the public felt uneasy about this mix because it only required water. You know, they, people thought that it was too easy. No, is, it, is it really true? You just need to add water and bake it? So basically the company altered the formula a little bit, uh, changed the directions, and then also in addition say, okay, add water, add uh, some eggs uh, to the mix. And because of this, this idea worked and the sales of this product jumped back up uh, because people uh, felt that, okay, I, I need to do some extra steps in order for this, uh, this, this cake mix, uh, this cake to be able to be good. So this uh, story sort of r reminds me of how, so, again, some people react to this plan of salvation. You know, to, to them, it, it may sound too easy, too simple to be true. Uh, is it true that all you need to do is 
uh, put my faith in Jesus Christ and uh, repent of my sins. Uh, and I don't need to do anything else because Jesus did all of the work. Uh, you know, they, they, they often think, okay, what must I do to try to add to this recipe for salvation? Uh, they, again, they think about good works, they think about uh, the, the righteous works that they have done, uh, but we forget about God's mercy. So again, like, unlike uh, the, this cake mix manufacturer that uh, basically changed the formula, uh, God doesn't change His formula for salvation to, to make it more marketable. The gospel that we proclaim is free of works, even though it may sound too easy. It is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. God did all the work to provide us with salvation. And because of that, we can have this satisfaction. So again, when are the times when we do not experience true eternal satisfaction? As we said, the second point, the second moment, we do not experience true eternal satisfaction when we believe that we must work in order to earn it. So maybe for some of us, uh, we need to let go of this idea that we need to do something, that we need to work, that we need to earn our salvation. Uh, again, we're not saved by our good works. We are saved, rather, to do good works. You know, that's a very big difference. We're not saved by our good works, but rather we are saved to do good works. Because of what Jesus has done in our lives, because we have been saved, and because uh, He has transformed us, we want to live our life in a way by doing good works to praise God for it. Now finally, I believe that in this passage, we will see that there is one more moment. One more moment when we will see uh, when we may not experience this true eternal satisfaction. So I'll, I'll give you this uh, third point right away as well. So here's the, the third moment. We do not experience true eternal satisfaction when we do not come to Jesus and believe that only He can provide it. I'll say that one more time. The third point, we do not experience true eternal satisfaction when we do not come to Jesus and believe that only He can be able to provide it. Let's read uh, from verse 30 again. So they said to him, Then what signs do you do that we may see and believe you? What, uh, what works do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So again, Jesus had told, already told them that only He, can, as the Son of Man, can be able to provide them with salvation. But the crowds doubted Jesus. Uh, how can they believe Him? So uh, again, this is why they asked Jesus for a sign. So remember, a sign is something that's supposed to point to a destination, point to another message. But again, didn't they already see a sign? No, before, when uh, they were on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, didn't Jesus already perform a miracle by feeding 5,000 people with just five loaves of bread and two fish? That was already a sign for them to say that He is the true God who can provide them a salvation. So then uh, they talked about what, what God, the, how, the bread that God had provided to uh, their, their forefathers, like in the, the Israelites. Uh, and basically this was their logic. So, they basically said that, oh, God had given the Israelites bread from heaven while they were in the, the wilderness. So God had provided them with manna as they were wandering in uh, the, the, the wilderness for 40 years. But here, we see that Jesus had fed them from earth. So shouldn't He feed them from food from heaven if He was really from God? So this is their logic. This is the way that the crowds were thinking. But let's see, how does Jesus respond? Let's read from verse 32. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. Verse 33. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So here Jesus is saying that it was not Moses who had provided them bread from heaven, but it was God. And then He went on to say that God had already given them a sign by giving them the bread because He is the one who God had sent from heaven to give life to this world. So how do the people respond again? Verse 34, they said to Him, Sir, give us this bread always. So they asked for this bread. And then verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to Me shall, ne shall not hunger, and whoever believes in Me shall never thirst. So Jesus answered by saying, you ask for this bread, 
I am the bread of life. So when Jesus says, I am, you know, he's referring that he is the pre-existing God before all of creation. He's actively revealing himself to us when he says, I am. So what is he revealing to him uh, in this case? When he says, I am the bread of life. He's saying that whoever comes to him shall not hunger anymore. Whoever believes in him shall never thirst. Jesus is saying that only he can be able to provide them with true eternal satisfaction. So again, when are the times uh, when we do not experience this true eternal satisfaction? The third point, the third moment, we do not experience true eternal satisfaction when we do not come to Jesus and believe that only He can be able to provide it. So I think uh, many times in our life we may, uh, again, we, we try to find satisfaction, we find, try to find something that will fulfill us, and because we've tried so hard and we uh, can't find this satisfaction. So, you know, sometimes we try to lower our expectation. You know, because if we lower our expectation and sort of like uh, bring down our, our desire a bit, then the likelihood of us gaining that uh, satisfaction it would be uh, uh, greater. So let's say that uh, we have a standard that, uh, I, that you want to always get uh, a 4.0 GPA. You always want to get A's. Uh, but you can't get it, so you say, okay, I'll, I'll be okay with an A-, minus, or I'll be okay with a B. Your parents may not be okay with that, but you see, sometimes we may feel like, okay, maybe if I lowered my standards, then I can be able to try to achieve that, uh, that satisfaction. Uh, but here, when it comes to our salvation, like our solution is not necessary to try to change or, or lower our expectation for how we are, we are to be satisfied. Because this is the way that we were created. You know, if we were made with this internal desire to be able to find spiritual satisfaction, uh, it, then there has to be something that can be able to, that exists, that will fulfill that spiritual satisfaction. So, in, in general, if there is a need in our life, then there has to exist a solution for that need. So, for example, if we experience hunger, then this shows that in this life, there has to exist food. If we experience thirst in this life, then this shows that there must exist water. If we experience coldness in this life, then that means that it has, there has to exist heat. So likewise, if we experience a need for love, then there has to exist an ultimate love that can only come from an all-loving God. So this is like one, one argument that shows that there has to exist an all-loving God. And that all-loving God is Jesus. Again, in verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So if we want to experience this true eternal satisfaction, Jesus calls for us to come to Him. So how do we come to Jesus. How do we come to Him? So as we uh, read, this is clarified in the next phrase. In verse 35, whoever comes to me shall not hunger. So here's the next phrase. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So the second line is clar clarifies the first, first line. So when Jesus says, come to me, He's also talking about how we do so, by believing in so to come to Jesus means for us to believe in Him. So maybe if you're here today, maybe you do not know Jesus yet. Uh, this is an invitation for you to come to Him, to believe in Him, because Jesus Christ, He knows you. He died on the cross for your sins. And through putting your faith in Him, you can be able to receive this eternal life and find this true eternal satisfaction they have always been seeking throughout your whole life. You no longer need to search anymore. And maybe for those of us who are already believers, who are already Christians, we still need to come to Jesus. Uh, maybe some of us need to return to Him. Maybe some of us feel very far away from Him. Maybe we have turned away from Him and we have forgotten that only Jesus can be able to eternally satisfy us. Uh, many of us are familiar with uh, John 3.16. You know, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, in, in the Greek, this word believe is not just a one-time action. It's not like, okay, you believe and that's it. But rather in Greek, this word believe is a continuing type of believing. 
meaning that we need to continue to believe in, in, in Jesus throughout the whole life. So this invites us to continually come to Jesus, to continually believe in Him and see that He can be able to eternally satisfy us. So when Jesus tells the crowds uh, to, to, whoever uh, comes to me shall ne- not hunger, whoever believes in me shall never thirst, He's trying to tell them, again, I am the bread of life. I can be able to provide for you. You, you come to me seeking for the provision for, uh, for bread and for physical needs, but I can provide you with something greater, with your salvation, with this true eternal satisfaction. So imagine if everyone were to come to Jesus and to experience salvation, and if, conti- if Christians continue to seek Jesus for eternal satisfaction, then we won't need to turn to other false means in this life. We don't need to listen to what the culture tells us of what we need to look for. No one will need to turn to sin, which, is a f- which promotes a false satisfaction. We will turn to Jesus alone. So let's review everything that we've learned from this passage here in John chapter 6, uh, verses 22 to 35. We've answered the main question of when are the times we do not experience true eternal satisfaction? And from this passage, we saw that there were three moments. So let's review. The first point, we do not experience true eternal satisfaction when we seek Jesus for the wrong reasons. The second point, we do not experience true eternal satisfaction when we believe that we need to work in order to earn it. And finally, as we said, the third point, we do not experience true eternal satisfaction when we do not come to Jesus and believe that only He can be able to provide it. Again, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And as God, He revealed to us that only He can provide us with this true eternal satisfaction. Do we believe this? And it's my hope and prayer that we all do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you uh, so grateful that we have this opportunity again to learn from your word. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, you will help us to see that you indeed are the bread of life, meaning that you can be able to truly satisfy us. Father, I pray that you help us to have a chance to reflect, to be able to see what are some of the things that we maybe have like trying to, to go after in this life. Maybe some uh, idols, maybe some other pursuits, and we are distracted from going towards you. Father, if that, if that is the case, I pray that you would help us to be able to repent. Help us to put aside all of these other things and turn our eyes and our focus back on you because you are the bread of life. Help us to see that you can be able to satisfy us. And Lord, if we already put our faith in you, uh, we should already be satisfied in the fact that you have provided us with salvation uh, through your work on the, the cross. Uh, that one day we can look forward to being in all of eternity in your presence and to be able to, uh, to, to love you, Lord. Uh, I pray that uh, this is something that we will look forward to in this life, that we can be able to have this hope that will keep us going, no matter what challenges that we face in this life, no matter what, what trials that we may, may experience, Lord. May we turn to you for true eternal satisfaction and not turn to anything else. Father, we love you and we thank you. We want to lift up all these things in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name. Amen.